Good morning. The Lord be with you. Wonderful to see you in worship today. If you do not have a printed bulletin, you can go to the home page of our website and download it to your mobile device. Parents, I hope you'll take your children to our Time with Children, which is found on our YouTube channel. For easy access to our YouTube channel, you can always go to the home page of our website, and on the right-hand side, there's a little red icon. Just hit that, and it will take you to our YouTube channel. Two Bible classes meet on Zoom every Wednesday at noon and 6. Bob Cox is currently also teaching a class right now on early Christian apocrypha. These are early Christian writings by the church that didn't make it into the Bible. He's doing that class on Wednesdays at 7. On Thursday at 7, our Peace and Justice Work Group is sponsoring a discussion on recent legislative actions in Delaware. For more information on all of these and for the Zoom links, you go to the Weekly Word or our online bulletin. On Sunday, July 25th, we'll host a collection of vegetables, if you're growing vegetables in your garden, that will go to the Reach Riverside Community Refrigerator. The refrigerator is open to anyone in the community, anytime, day or night. We hope that if you're having an abundance of vegetables, you'll share those. On the 25th, go to the back part of the parking lot, either before or after the service, and someone will be there to receive your tomatoes and other wonderful vegetables. Let's see, today's beautiful flowers are given to the glory of God and in memory of Art Butters by his wife, Anna. Westminster will have Vacation Bible School beginning the week of July 26th. For information about the, um, the week and also about the COVID-19 restrictions, you can go to the online bulletin or to the weekly word. Beginning next Sunday, July 18, you'll no longer have to wear a mask in worship. If you are fully vaccinated, you do not have to wear a mask in the sanctuary. We ask that you sit at the front part of the sanctuary or in the side transepts. If you're not vaccinated or if you prefer to wear a mask, we'll have spaces socially distanced in the back part of the sanctuary and up in the balcony. Everyone will be required to wear a mask entering and exiting the building to um, help out and to be welcoming to those people who have not been vaccinated. We hope to begin live streaming our worship service into Rodney Chapel next Sunday morning. We're working hard on that right now. The right piece has to come in this week. Um, that space now also has the same air filters and ionization units that the sanctuary has, making that space as safe as being in a hospital. We're going to provide materials for young children. That space is especially going to be welcoming to young families who have their children with them. The donations to Emanuel Dining Room have been going on for more than a year now. Many of you have been very faithful about that. We're having a bit of a dip here in the summer, and so I'd like to encourage you, when you come to worship, um, if you can remember, to bring water, peanut butter sandwich, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, cookies, chips, um, fruit, anything like that to donate to Emanuel Dining Room. They've still not opened yet. We hope they will be opening soon. But until then, they are really depending on us and other organizations to provide them with these vital necessities to help the people in our neighborhood and community who are food insecure. It's always a joy to have Kim Raley in our service. Kim is the professor of flute at Westchester University. She's also the principal flute in both the um, Delaware Symphony and Opera Delaware. Kim, thank you for sharing your musical gifts with us again. Now we remember why we are here. To give thanks for the precious gift of life. 
and to glean a word of wisdom for the living of our days.
siblings in Christ, let us join our voices as one to offer our opening prayer, praying together. God of our lives, you are always calling us to follow the future, inviting us to new ventures, new challenges, and new ways to touch the hearts of all. When we are fearful of the unknown, give us courage. When we worry that we are not up to the task, remind us that you would not call us if you did not believe in us. Amen. The words of today's anthem are actually taken from this morning's scripture lesson from Colossians. Now this city was in what is today modern-day Turkey. Just a few years after Paul wrote this letter to this small Christian community, the city was actually devastated by an earthquake. They rebuilt and existed for another 1,200 years before the people dispersed to other nearby communities Today, there are only ruins there. The Apostle Paul writes, Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with God in Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient, You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, destructive language. Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on a new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, Holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other, and if any has a grievance with the other, forgive, just as the Lord has forgiven you. And over all these virtues, Put on love, which binds all of them together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, in songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Did you read where a passenger on Southwest Air Flight slugged the flight attendant and knocked out her two front teeth? The Federal Aviation Administration says that there's been a spike in disorderly or dangerous behavior on planes. In a typical year, the agency sees between 100 and 150 
formal cases of bad passenger behavior. In just the first five months of this year, they have heard 2,500 cases. As a result, the Transportation Security Administration has begun offering self-defense classes to flight attendants and pilots. Politicians and journalists are receiving death threats. Synagogues and mosques are being assaulted and attacked. Since the beginning of the pandemic, there's been a large increase in the number of Asian Americans who've been attacked. Why all of this dreadful behavior? Many offer their ideas on why civility is being drowned out by hostility. The boundary between acceptable and unacceptable behavior has collapsed. Some use social media as a loudspeaker to broadcast nastiness that was once considered beyond the pale. Fear and frustration drive much of the rancor and the combative behavior. Inconvenient truths are replaced by personal opinions and conspiracy theories. Some seek to crucify anyone who sees things in a different light. Seems to me our country is getting meaner. What drives your attitudes and emotions? What drives your thinking? What are the compelling forces that motivate your approach to others? Since all of us swim in the sea of our society, the values of our culture are constantly pressing on us. In his letter to the Colossians, the Apostle Paul notes that many of these same forces tugged at first century Christians. To counter the negative values that permeate culture, Paul writes, set your minds on things that are above, not on earthly things. Now, he's not encouraging followers of Jesus to focus on the afterlife and to give up on the present life. Neither is he claiming that we should ignore present reality and pretend that life's just a lot better than we know that it really is. This is his way of drawing a distinction between what's life-giving and life-wrecking. Paul names a few of the things that just tear people's lives apart. He says, put to death sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. Then in what sounds as if he is specifically addressing us in our context, he says, you must also rid yourselves of anger, rage, malice, slander, and destructive language. Then he highlights one other item. He says, do not lie to one another. And Paul's list is not exhaustive, it's suggestive. When he wrote his letter to the church over in Galatia, he named some other destructive behaviors as well envy, jealousy, strife. It's Paul's way of urging us to live according to our better angels rather than our lesser ones. He wants people to know how much better life can be when we opt for altruism rather than selfishness. Although we're often hesitant to admit it, all of us have a dark side. I wish I could say I always choose what's positive and enriching. Don't you? But it wouldn't be honest, would it? We can be compassionate, 
but we can also be mean-spirited. We can be trustworthy, but we can be dishonest. We can be generous, but we can also be self-absorbed. Knowing that each of us occasionally embraces darkness rather than light, Paul writes, So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Do you know what he's talking about when he says, raised with Christ? He's alluding to baptism. Baptism was a powerful symbol for Paul. It represents our dying to this corrupt self and then being resurrected to our virtuous self. Paul knew this from personal experience. Originally, Paul was a Pharisee, and he prided himself on trying to wipe out all of these people in this new religious sect who believed that Jesus was the Messiah and called themselves the people of the way. There's no general way of putting it. Paul was mean-spirited. He was passionate about persecuting followers of Jesus. He was vicious. But after a dramatic conversion, he became a fervent follower of Christ. He was totally unrecognizable to his former friends. He acquired nobler values, loftier goals, and a refined perspective on life. He described this transformation he had undergone as being created anew. In one of his letters to the church in Corinth, he wrote, so if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. He was describing this new spirit within those who follow Jesus, which prompts them to relate to other people in beautiful ways. The core of this new spirit is, of course, love. And in his letter to the Colossians, Paul doesn't just speak about love in general terms. He gets specific. He rattles off definitive elements of love, compassion, Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. In his new book, Celtic theologian Philip Newell talks about his mentor, George MacLeod. MacLeod was a minister in the Church of Scotland, an influential figure in the 20th century. His favorite saying was, matter matters. That is, although God is spirit, God cares deeply about physical matter, the created world, and all of its creatures. MacLeod emphasized that the way to touch the heart of God is through the concrete action of caring for others. McLeod told the following story on himself. I was busy. I was writing letters. I was self-important. My little daughter was going to school that morning for the first time. She came into my room in her first school uniform. I said, your tie isn't quite straight. Then I looked into her eyes. She wasn't crying, but she was so disappointed. She had not come in for tie inspection. She'd come in to show me that she was ready to go off to school for the first time. It was going to be a terrific day until I let her down. What is that bit in the gospel? 
Who shall, whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, it would be better for a great millstone to be tied around his neck and he be cast into the sea. I ran downstairs. I did all the right things. I crossed the road with her. I went to school with her. But I had missed the moment. Missed the point. I still see her eyes. Sometimes when I'm very busy. Almost every time I'm writing letters. I know I'm forgiven, but I will never forget. Our spiritual life does not become robust by withdrawing from the world. Rather, it's found in diving more deeply into the affairs of the world and into the most ordinary matters of everyday life. Author Jake Owensby recalls the terror that seized him just a few weeks before his wedding. Now, many people worry about whether or not they're marrying the right person. But he told his fiance that that wasn't the basis of his fear. What prompted his panic was the realization that he was free to nurture or to destroy their relationship. He said, nothing could compel me or stop me but me. He explained to his wife-to-be by sharing a story by the existentialist philosopher Sartre. The philosopher said, to imagine a man hiking along the side of a cliff that has no guardrail. His heart is pounding. His palms are sweaty. His mouth is dry. It is a long way down. Have you ever been in a situation like that? I can remember one day when I was hiking at the edge of the Grand Canyon, walking along a path that had no guardrails. I was terrified. Well, Sartre says the man's anxiety in this situation is off the scale. And while most of us would assume that he is afraid of falling, Sartre discerns something deeper. At the edge of the precipice, he says, the man discovers his own freedom. Nothing prevents him from jumping. Neither his so-called will to live, nor the circumstances of his life will make him step back from the ledge. He can choose to leap or not to leap. The context within which we grow up and the past decisions that we have made exert a very strong influence on the decisions we make today. However, we still have the freedom to choose. We can choose malice, strife, revenge, arrogance or indifference, as many in our nation are choosing. Or we can choose compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. In the final three verses of today's passage, Paul gives three pieces of advice to help us choose wisely. I've changed his declarative statements into questions. Three questions for all of us to ponder. Does the word of Christ dwell in you richly? 
does the peace of Christ rule in your heart? Does a spirit of gratefulness dominate your thinking? If each of us will personally wrestle with each of these questions and then express our answers in concrete terms, we can give our world what it so desperately needs today. Siblings in Christ, let us go to God in prayer. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we come to you this day in gratitude for the new life we have in Christ. We give thanks that you have claimed us in the waters of baptism and commissioned us for ministry to this world. As we gather again around this font, pour out your grace upon us, renew us, transform us, and shape us into the people you created and call us to be. Help us who have heard your word read and proclaimed to live as disciples of the risen Lord. Set our minds on things that are above and stir our hearts to follow you that we might love with Christ's love. Though you call us to new life, O God, we confess that we cling to the ways of this world, to habits that diminish, to emotions that strangle, to practices that tear away at your vision of wholeness for all. Recreate us, O God, and free us from the things that, that threaten to separate us from you. Transform our anger into righteous anger. Channel our passion into compassion and turn our greed into a longing for justice and righteousness. Clothe us with loving kindness and send us out as instruments of healing and peace. God, we pray for our nation, which is grappling with tragedy from sea to shining sea. As the mission in Surfside, Florida shifts from search and rescue to recovery, we hold in our hearts the families of those buried in rubble, 
and pray that you would surround this devastated community with your peace that surpasses all understanding. As the Pacific Northwest recovers from sweltering temperatures, we hold in our hearts the families of those lost to the heat and pray that you would draw those who are grieving into your loving embrace. And as our eyes focus upon stories that are deemed newsworthy, we also hold in our hearts those near and far whose suffering goes unnoticed, but whose stories are known to you. Surround them with your love that is stronger than death, that they might know your peace and experience your wholeness. Creator God, in the beginning you called forth order out of chaos, Breathe upon us now, we pray, and bring order to this chaotic world. By your Spirit, draw us, whom you have claimed and called, into your redemptive work. Clothe us with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, and above all, love, that we might be living members of a living Christ, ready to bear witness to the risen Lord until your kingdom comes. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In our attitudes and in our actions, may we seek compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And may the love of Christ rule in our hearts. Amen. Amen.